What's going on, y'all? My name is Tommy. Who? Welcome back to the channel. This week, we are cracking open the backs of a lot of books. Call it an episode of the Ancestry Anthology. Call it an episode of the Forgotten Race Review. Mostly call it an episode of the Creature Chronicles. Right? Is that what I named this fucking series? Today, we're talking about the Asura. If you're liking what you're seeing, like, subscribe, ding the bell. Stay got up on all your stuff for now. Let's dive in. Hockey So on planet Earth, the Asura, I think I've said Asura more than twice on the internet. Sorry, y'all. Words are hard, but they come to us from India, much like the angels, the devils, the demons, the everything else. Hell, much like all of Pathfinder, where you can start in He-Man and end up in fantasy Russia or go the other way and then end up in somebody's fairy tale, so on and so forth. As it so often is, the stories we tell on planet Earth track back into the things that we do recreationally. Praise Lika, but don't let the Asura hear you say that. On Glorian, the Asura are a race of outsiders who were created as a result of a divine accident. There are a bunch of different points in the history of Pathfinder's universe where this could have happened, like when the gods made the first world and then abandoned it, but as creations of a divine accident. As you might imagine, these beings who don't have a divine patron, I guess is the right word, to track back to, like angels and devils and demons and things do, makes folks feel a certain kind of way. In this case, an almost universal desire to subvert divine authority. When they were first created, they hid in the maelstrom, eventually moving down to what would become hell, and then they claimed it. And then Asmodeus and the army of exiles from heaven showed up, there was this big old council, the beings that already lived there, your Velstrak, your Asuras, your Gigas, they all got together trying to figure out how they're going to defend their home, uniting as one. But they were all of them betrayed by an Asura Rana known as Geryon. Do you recognize that name? Yeah, when he betrayed all of his friends, Asmodeus made them an archdevil. Present day, the Asura still populate the like hellish hinterlands and anywhere else where they can find home for themselves, really. On Galarian, that's often like abandoned temples or states like Rahadum, where religion is outright banned, where they continue subverting divine authority. But what does that look like mechanically? Well, kids, we are gonna do a little bit of 1A today. Like other beings of the lower planes, the presence of an Asura in one's bloodline can create things like half fiends and tieflings. If you ask the average Asura, they see this in the same way that they do like half celestials, but if they can corrupt the priests of a deity into it, then hey, you know, what's a little more anguish for the greater good? This is going to be the shortest episode of the Forgotten Race Review. Man, the name of that series did not age well. Ah, past Tommy, you did what you could. But in first edition, a fault spawn tiefling received a plus two to its dexterity and wisdom with a minus two to its intelligence as opposed to buffs to bluff and stealth. They received a plus two racial bonus on appraise and knowledge local. And as opposed to darkness as a spell-like ability, they were given hideous laughter. In second edition, the fault spawn tiefling lineage gives one vestigial signs of an Osra has better description for what this would look like. And I like that vestigial signs of being an Osra once like a second set of shoulder blades without usable arms, a set of mostly closed eyes where eyes don't belong or scarring that might resemble a mouth. Such tieflings have the find fault reaction. When one attempts a saving throw against the spell or magic effect, but hasn't rolled yet, you find some kind of fault with the magic and you use that flaw to protect yourself. You get a plus one circumstance bonus to your save against the triggering effect. If the effect is divine and originates from a worshiper of the deity you chose for your grudge, it becomes a plus two. I feel like that ought to have been just divine spells. It's niche as it is, and then it like stretches out farther almost into to the realm of unplayable or at least like definitely talk to your gm and be like hey are we converting hell's rebels into tui okay cool and picking asmodeus and then you're probably fine until like a, some random arch devil worshiper shows up i don't know i think i would still count that i digress at fifth level the fault spawn can once per hour use towering presence for one action 
become large until the beginning of your next turn. This does all of the other things that getting large does. Your stuff grows, your clumsy one, your reach goes a little bit bigger and you get the status bonus to damage. Not bad if you're a fighter and just really wanted to be large, but only sometimes. Or like for when the wizard is out and you just need bigger reach right now. Also, a magic at level nine lets you cast Blood Vendetta and Death Knell once per day as divine innate spells. Probably hurts a little when you do that. And then at 17th, Dominion Aura. Once per day for two actions. This is so fucking metal. For a short time, you fully manifest the expectations of the God Destroyer within you. I should put Blast Beats under that. I'm gonna put Blast Beats under that and then keep going with it. You fully manifest the expectations of the God Destroyer within you! All creatures within a 10 foot emanation take 8d6 force damage with a basic fortitude save. That creature that fails the save is knocked prone. For a minute, any creature that ends their turn within that emanation takes 5d6 force damage with a basic fort save. If you aren't drained, you can choose to become drained too when you use this to increase the radius from 10 to 20. Feet. So far as their stat blocks go, they've been printed in both editions. We're going to focus on the 2e monster stat block with one exception. Because it hasn't been printed yet, that makes me kind of sad. The Asurenda has a very unique ability which helps the Asura continue to make more of themselves. Very, very, very blasphemous atheist souls that end up in hell can sometimes get turned into Asura, but as a full round action, Asurenda can turn creatures that they've eaten within the last 24 hours into a Tripper Asura. I think I'm saying that right. That being a CR2 be made into an improved familiar, like a like how a Pit Fiend makes Lemura, that kind of thing. Those Tripper Asuras remain loyal to the Asuranda who made them as long as they remain that way. But with enough Tripper Asuras around, the Asuranda can just eat all of them and turn them into an equivalent hit dice amount of other Asuras. It can only make new Asura once per day, but it can spit out Tripper Asuras just constantly. And I can't make another Asurenda. Wow, this feels so much like the Pit Fiends that I wonder who was copying off of whom. Anyway, in 2e, running from level 1 to level 14, we have four different kinds of beings. The Shakin, Adukate, Japalasura, and Necromasa. I think it's really interesting that all four of these speak infernal. My new headcanon for when Asmodeus led forces into hell was that there was already this language in place and when he was colonizing hell he just stole it. But other than that an immunity to curses as cursed as they already are and a weakness to good and like dark vision but don't worry about it. That's the only thing these beings have in common. The Naga video was so much shorter compared to this. Shaquin are the worst little corrupty bastards. They can change shape to take on the appearance of a small humanoid. It doesn't change anything about them, but it might cause their thorns. Thorns? Where, where do you have thorns? This is a funny way to say claws, I guess. Into fists. They take on the form of innocent children. They go to school. A teacher will find this very, very smart, bright kid, take them under their wing, this is the star pupil, and then the Osura begins to ask questions and coax their prey into blasphemy. And then when people find out, they change shape into something else, because with a one-hour ritual, they can become a different, persistent version of themselves. This whole time running under things like non-detection and magic aura to hide their alignments, and touch of idiocy and charm to keep people beguiled. Also, they're poisonous. Fun. The Aducate are a little less this is me trying to corrupt you and a little more this is me cursed. There are stories that a long time ago, two Asura twins challenged a great warrior to duel them in turn. And then when they broke that and attacked him together, the warrior got so mad that he slammed one into the other and they fused. Two heads, two hearts, two chest mouths, one elite warrior, which forms like the backbone of the Asura armies. Much like things like Eddins, this is expressed literally in their mechanics. They get two reactions, the second of which can only be used to attack of opportunity. They can auto pass saves against mental effects by shunting the mental effect into one of their brains. This makes the auto kick clumsy too and gives them a minus 10 foot circumstance penalty to speeds and shuts off a lot of their abilities, but lets them succeed automatically. The auto kick can also, for one action, 
If their last action was a strike that dealt damage, they can stride up to 10 feet and then strike, so like elf step, basically. Get more than two of these on a battlefield, and they're very, very fast, and they're very, very all over the place, and if you're relying on, like, mental effects to shut off opponents, this was scarier in 1e, I'm sure. The Japalisura lean into that, like, divine prophecy trope by lying, telling people what they want to hear, and then twisting their perceptions of their fate to, like, further the Asura's goals. Man, the lore in these is so fucking cool. I'm just gonna keep grabbing the text. The first Japalisura rose from the remains of three demigod archers, sons of a goddess who feared their rise to power and slew them. Their merged form was so terrifying that they struck a deal with the powerful Asura Rana to alter their face into something more pleasing. The true cruelty of the enchantment became clear only later. The Japalisura had a new face, but that face transformed into a different one every minute, each one more hideous than the last. This horrific visage manifestation is represented mechanically in the disorienting faces ability. A 30-foot aura, which forces creatures who enter or start their turn in the aura to attempt a DC 32 will save. On a critical success, nothing happens, and you're immune for 10 rounds. On a success, nothing happens at all. On a failure, victims become so disoriented that they take a minus 2 circumstance penalty to checks and DCs while they remain in the aura. A critical failure makes this minus three, which is enormous. A minus three makes an on-level creature a terrifying creature. And if it was stronger than you, if this is like a boss fight against one of these, that's... Whew, huh. This gets worse. For one action, once per round, the Japalisura can whisper words to an adjacent creature and deception check against their DC, which is now lower. On a critical success for 10 rounds, the target believes that one creature of the Japalisura's choice is its mortal foe, and it must spend all of its actions to reach and attack them, though they can try to save again at the end of the turn. On a success, this happens just for a round. On a failure, you become temporarily immune for a day, but ugh, oh man. Likewise, their axes and arrows deal mental damage as well, each weapon carrying a veil of lies that tears at the target's psyche with this dangerous yet almost addictively sweet sensation. There are a lot of like non-mechanical implications for this that you could use in a lot of places. Ow, that hurt, but it felt really good. Don't you want more? The pain is temporary, just like the pain of losing your friend. Gross, I really like it. I likewise, if you shoot at them, they can snatch the arrow and fire it back, as if it wasn't already really bad. But top of the current pecking order, the Nicaramsa, I think I'm saying that right. I, again, forgive me. Y'all, if you know how to pronounce these better in the comments, please, please do. The deep scholars of religion, of all Asura kind, who use that knowledge to take advantage of the worshippers and then exploit them and destroy their faith from within. These are terrifying against divine spellcasters. With the pervert miracle reaction, if a foe within 60 feet casts Bless or any of the many beneficial spells that a Nicaramsa could cast to remove afflictions like their many Remove Disease, Remove Curse, Neutralize Poison, the Nicaramsa counteracts it, and if they succeed, the triggering creature gets a Bane spell. Or rather, if like the cleric was trying to remove disease the fighter, now suddenly they're also subject to the disease. Gross. Ugh. Likewise, for one action, they can focus their gaze on a creature within 60 feet. This is a once per day thing with the immunity. You make a will save on a critical success, that's the one you want. The Nicaramsa is caught off guard by how strong your brain is and becomes stupefied too until the end of their next turn. On a success, nothing happens. On a failure, the target becomes stupefied too for a minute for ostensibly the combat, right? For the next 10 rounds, there's a flat check. Anytime you want to cast spells and your spells are weak or on a critical failure, it's Superfine. three for an hour. Ooh, wah, ah, 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 that's bad. That was bad too. Shut up. Likewise, they appear as large creatures with a tongue that reaches 20 feet out. But this is an illusion. The Karamsa are in fact medium, and a creature that interacts with them can attempt a DC 36 will save to see them as they truly are. If they succeed, the reach of the Nicaramsa's attacks against that foe specifically decrease to 5 feet or 10 with their tongue. If everything in the Nicaramsa's vicinity successfully disbelieves the illusion, they become medium and enfeebled too for as long as everyone sees this. So like, pro tip, take some captives. 
some captives of really low level who could never, ever, ever see through and just leave them in the room you're planning on fighting the adventuring party. But Asura are incredibly interesting for a lot of different reasons. Because they are so broad, you can use them almost anywhere. Dump a Shaqeen in a like a very basic beginning adventure. Dump a Shaqeen in Strength of Thousands. I think that would have been a really cool call. Child prodigy found in a like district of Nintambu who wants to get in the Magambia early but the Magambi is a college, so they're too young. Well, I guess you could just be a halfling. Yeah, yeah, they're just a halfling. Nice, we did it, team. Got a lot of divine casters in the party. Dump a Nikaramsa in as like a campaign ender, but don't dump them in towards like the last arc and let the, the paladin's church fall apart, right? That, mm, we love that subversion. I wanna like the Aducate more. I, meh. There's not a lot that speaks to me on this one other than just body horror. But I think the Japalishthura is my favorite of all of them. Not only does it buff the hell out of itself by debuffing everyone around it, they have a lot of really interesting out of combat spells. Augury at will. Not only does that give it a 10 minute, yeah, I should probably do this. So a Japalishthura probably only engages with the party when its chances of success are the absolute highest lest it otherwise try to like illusory disguise itself out. Being under a constant non-detection is real nice if you need to illusory disguise yourself as literally anyone else to get away from the party until it's time to get down to fighting the party or to pose as the soothsayer in the first place. Corruption, subversion, the thing your character has grown to expect or the thing that like a player has read about a deity and assumes a monolith thrown back on them makes for really really interesting stories and beings that exist because divine powers messed up is a whole thing to tear in in and of itself it's like campaigns on the first world but more sinister and more actively working to undo things it's ugh. It's terrifying. This one's getting real long though. That's all the time I have for today. What do y'all think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. For now, thank y'all so much for watching. We'll see you next time.